Okay, at this time we're going to call to order the September 8, 2020 called board meeting for the Tuscaloosa City Schools. At this time, let's have a period of silence. We will follow it by the Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, please remember uh, a member of the TCS family, Dr. Schultz, his mother passed away. Uh, please remember him in your thoughts and prayers. So a period of silence and we'll follow that by the Pledge of Allegiance. Attention, salute, pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Good evening. Okay, at this time, uh, we have a motion to adopt the September 8, 2020 called board meeting agenda. So moved. Second the motion. We have a motion. We have a second by Mr. Simmons. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Be approved. Item number four, public comments. Um, so to remind the public, when I call your name, please approach this podium. Uh, you'll be given five minutes to speak. At the end of the five minutes, I will cut you off. So please don't make me be the bad guy this evening. Uh, please give me your name. Um, someone from TCS will wipe down the microphone uh, between each uh, speaker. So if you feel comfortable, it certainly is easier for the board members to hear you um, if you feel comfortable letting down your mask. Um, board members are not allowed to respond or answer any questions. So without further ado, uh, Mr. Rick Webb. Try to go paperless this time. Good evening. Good evening. I'm here once again because I've been appalled by the public communications to the media regarding reopening our schools. Any comment that suggests the situation is improving in Tuscaloosa is entirely divorced from reality. On the day I saw an interview with an executive of this system on WBRC, the 14-day positivity rate in Tuscaloosa grew to 8.5%. Consider that UA students may not even be reflected in these numbers. Any suggestion that the on-the-ground reality is improving in Tuscaloosa is pure data sophistry. But I'm not surprised by this, given what I have come to know about the leadership of this school system. It has come to my attention that some schools in this system have already attempted to bring all your virtual students onto campus for a testing series that's not even required by the state. This system goes beyond what is required and subjects our students to even more standardized testing because of a supposed commitment to data-driven decision-making. Yet here we are with these same leaders seemingly trying to find any kind of data contrivance or outright ignorance of trends possible to back into a predetermined decision. Virtual school started out a little choppy. Well, maybe you shouldn't have rolled out a new digital platform install new standard operating procedures, and rework schedules in six working days. This circumstance is not a sign that virtual cannot work. This is a sign of lacking executive leadership in clearly defining processes to the school and insufficient install time given to support staff and classroom educators. You weren't able to procure 2,200 more Chromebooks. Somehow people managed in the spring. We shut down in-person instruction in the spring with no confirmed cases, but want to reopen when Tuscaloosa is possibly the epicenter of the virus outbreak in this state. Again, this is not data-driven. This is backwards engineered sophistry. I can't say I'm surprised by these events. I probably wouldn't be here today if not by a sheer fluke circumstance that opened my eyes. My, work, my wife ended up having to work from home one day at the start of the semester due to the internet going out at her school. I was taking care of my own work, but I heard something that caught my ear. She was talking to someone who I later learned was a central office leader about her concerns with reopening. She was choking up, nearly in tears, and all I heard from the other side of the call was a person talking past any of her concerns and instead offering up an empty bunch of platitudes and what amounts, in my opinion, to calls for educator martyrdom. In that moment, I knew that the highest levels of this system does not truly care about their employees. 
I don't know how you can even say that the reopening plan is about the children when the children are not well served by harried, anxiety-filled, or quarantined faculty and staff. I don't even think this system's leadership truly cares about all of the children in this system. I think this push is ultimately about serving a political minority interest of higher income earners, concentrated mostly within a single cluster of schools. The, cl the school cluster breakdown of all year virtual selection, in my opinion, is probably the strongest vote of confidence this board has to inform their decisions. Do the constituents of the East and West clusters, of which I belong, appear to trust this school system's ability to protect their children? The numbers indicate no. I ask the members of this board who represent these parts of the community to keep that in mind. To those who represent the North Cluster, I implore you to consider the quality of education your constituent students will receive considering the faculty and staff will have to serve the vast majority of their students in school during a pandemic. If these decisions are about educational outcomes, then vote no today. If it is about our educators being your constituents' babysitters, then I ask you to discard your political artifice and say that plainly. Finally, to the entire central office support staff, since you are working with such zeal to restart in-person instruction, I hope you also intend to send your children to in-person instruction. If you cannot display the highest confidence in your plans with your own blood, then why should the, the public trust said plans? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Webb. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Okay, next uh, will be Mr. Will Hawkins. Good evening, or good evening, actually, sir. I wish I could say it was a good evening. I'm here to speak on behalf of a number of concerned parents that are home tonight working extra hours because they're teaching their kids in schools and, we are, and this school board is not. It's time to open the schools. Multiple studies have shown that children are not high risk and are even lower risk for spreading COVID-19. The school system has accommodated the children who do not wish to open the classrooms. Where is the accommodation for the students that want to be in the classroom? These students have been without intense instruction face-to-face -face since March 16th, six months, half a year. It's time, it's time, it's time that this board faces the realization that virtual learning does not benefit any child in this system. Teachers are not taught how to teach virtually. They are taught how to teach face-to-face -face for one reason, because virtual learning does not work. No study has ever shown that virtual learning can accommodate every type of learner that that teacher will have in their classroom. It's time. It's time to talk about the science. The CDC, the Academy of, Pediat Academy of Pediatrics have strongly encouraged the physical reopening of schools for face-to-face -face learning. Districts around the county, the state, the country, and the world have done it. There is no reason this system can't do it either. Waiting any longer is only somebody's opinion, not based on scientific data. If a student does not want to attend in person, y'all have provided an option for them, and that's good for them. It's time to live up to your end of the bargain and open the classrooms. It's time. It's time to look at Schoology. This program was supposed to roll out next year, but instead it was rushed into this year when the platforms that were being utilized at the end of last year were working pretty dang good. The teachers were given two weeks to learn an entire new operating system, and the students were virtually given two days to familiarize themselves with that learning system. It has not worked. I listened to my daughter today as she sat in my office trying to complete her schoolwork. There are problems all over the place, this far in already with Schoology. Communication problems, assignment problems, 
login problems, lack of time problems. All of this could have been pre prevented. Her class time from last year in each class was about an hour and 15 minutes, 30 minutes this year. Please tell me how that's adequate. All of this could have been avoided. My youngest in first grade has no social studies and no science. Two of the building blocks for a good education. And here, I asked my daughter, I said, hey, go talk to your friends, give me some feedback on what they think about Schoology. And these are all quotes. Loss of Wi-Fi and a teacher blames the student. They get extra busy work. They can't see my friends. Codes are constantly changed and the student's not being told. Teachers don't have the time to fully explain the subject matter. Chromebook's freezing and teachers can't go back due to time restraints. Harder to keep up with assignments. Hate being in front of a screen all day. This sucks. I hate it. I'd rather be stuck in a classroom. The website sucks. We can't ever get help. Schoology is the worst and my favorite. One star. Would not recommend. This one broke my heart. I hate being at home alone. Let that sink in. Not exactly raving reviews in my opinion. Many of my teacher friends are just as frustrated as the students and they won't speak openly for fear of reprisals. But in private, they are tired, they are sad, and they are frustrated. And PO'd, to put it nicely, it's time, and I'm gonna go over. It's time, it's time to talk about athletics and hypocrisy. You may be wondering why I have a football helmet with me today. According to y'all, it's perfectly safe for two kids to run out on a football field, collide into each other and tackle with bodily fluids flying all over the place. Yet a simple mask is not sufficient in the classroom. Absolute hypocrisy. Earlier in the year, y'all recommended us to send our kids to a church, to para, to other daycare facilities. Hawkins, I'm gonna to have to cut you off. Forget it. <coughs> hypocrisy. Almost all of y'all's decisions have been absolutely hypocrisy. Who here likes to pay 50% for a full product? Nobody. That's what you're feeding us right now. Why do we continue to pay for a product that we aren't being given? Mr. Hawkins, excuse me, sir. Mr. Hawkins, I'm going to have to cut you off and call for the next person. I cannot allow anyone to go over. So at this time, Rachel, is it Colmer? Rachel Colmer, please. Thank you, Mr. Hawkins. Good evening, Ms. Colmer. Good evening. My name is Rachel Colmer. I am the mother of a fourth grade student at the Tuscaloosa Magnet School. I am grateful for your service in regard to serving on the board. I work under the operation of a board and I know how much time goes into these, so thank you for your service. I understand the decision, why the decision was made in the spring to close the schools because there were a lot of unknowns in regards to the coronavirus. Now, six months later, we have a lot more information on how to handle this virus and we know who is more at risk. I also understand that when things shut down in March, many of us were thrown into uncircum unknown circumstances and we were all trying to scramble to find a new normal, especially our teachers. My husband and I noticed the rapid decline in our daughter's learning and academic engagement as she was not participating in full-time school and we decided to take action on this so that she would not fall behind. We hired three tutors, and she was tutored three times each week for, uh, sorry, she was tutored for three hours each week. We also knew the district would not be able to provide technology for all the students, so we took it upon ourselves to buy a laptop. Again, another financial expense, all during a lockdown. I'm not saying to com uh, these things to complain, don't get me wrong, but I use these to point out that we were fortunate enough to handle these financial uh, expenses during a lockdown and after six months of expenses they add up and there are so many in this school district who just cannot do this 
Over the summer, our daughter was accepted to the magnet school and she was elated. She was already longing to return to school, but when the magnet school entered the picture, she was all the more eager to get back into the classroom. When she learned she wouldn't be able to walk in on August 20th, she was crushed. I am here tonight because of my deep concern that our schools are not open still. I understand the need for some households to participate in virtual school due to family and medical conditions, and I am very grateful that families can take advantage of those opportunities. Dr. Daria said last week in the board meeting that 42% of households in the district have signed up for virtual learning. That means there are 58% of households that want to see our students back in school. That's a majority. And I would think that the board would, uh, it would seem logical that the board's decision would reflect that. When the school board made the decision to, in July, to not reopen the schools, I felt like the priorities of the school board and the priorities of the city did not line up. And intentionally, or uh, personally, this is how I interpreted those decisions. It's safe for our children to go to para day camps, boys and girl clubs, daycare centers, but it's not safe for our children to be in schools. The city has some parks that are closed, which means it's not safe to go to parks, but it's safe to go to athletics, athletic events. The city has allowed bars to reopen with some restrictions, which means it's safe to go to a bar, but it's not, a safe, it's not safe for our children to attend school. I personally have not been at my church for six months because we are not having live uh, worship services yet but I can sit in a stand at a sporting event. I know where some churches, there are some churches in the area that have opened, and it's not safe for people to sing hymns, but it's safe for football players to be, uh, play sports in a full body contact sport. People who work in a retail store, a restaurant, a bar, are considered more of an essential employee than our teachers because our schools are not open. Lastly, a board member here said that when we reopen our schools, we need to be 100% sure our children are safe, and I appreciate that. But if we're looking at that exact percentage, then our schools will never be reopened with or without the coronavirus. Lastly, uh, ladies and gentlemen, the logic for me is flawed, and I feel like the priorities for me are backwards. I feel like these kinds of decisions are sending a negative message to our children. It conveys that sports are more important, that retail stores and restaurants and bars, which are good businesses for e the economy, but it sends a message to them that they are less important. And it sends a message to our teachers that they're not valued as much as employees. In my opinion, teachers are so essential I understand the decision before you is very difficult to make, and I don't envy y'all's position at all. But I couldn't sit any longer and be quiet on this matter. So I came here this evening on behalf of the 58% of households who desire to have the schools reopen. Please reopen the schools. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Colmer. Okay. You don't have to wipe it. We live in the same house. <coughs> And we have, is it Hannah Colmer? Hey, Hannah, thank you for being brave to come speak to us tonight. You're welcome. My name is Hannah Colmer. Hey, Hannah, I know you got a, you're a little person, so you got a little voice, so I want you to speak real loudly, okay? My you won't hurt our ears. My name is Hannah Colmer. I'm standing here because I feel like I need to. I want to open schools. I'm a new student at the Tuscaloosa Magnet Elementary School. I'm in fourth grade and I haven't even seen the inside. I want to make new friends and see an old friend. And I think other students do too. We can have football games but can't go to school. And I would like to know why. Football players spit, sweat, don't social distance, etc. At school we would do things such as wearing masks, social distancing, and washing our hands, etc. I really like my teacher and I want to meet her in person, but not only meet her, but learn in person. I don't want to stare at a screen and learn a new curriculum. I think some students agree with me. I feel like interacting in person so we can become new and better friends. Please reopen schools. I'm bored of virtual learning. Those are her words. We never, those are exactly what she wrote. Just FYI. Thank you, Thank Hannah. You.
Thank you, Mr. Smith. Okay, last on our list is Mr. Paul Rollins, Jr. I, I know we don't come in, but Miss Hannah, Miss Hannah, my little buddy, good job. Good evening, board. Good evening. Good evening. I had a few things that I wanted to discuss. Um, I'm going to pass over a few of them and just go straight to the um, going back into school. The board knows where I stand on it. I'm standing up here as a parent. Um, I know a lot of people said something about stats and everything else and what the CDC says, but I'm also speaking again from a business that's dealing with this monster of a pandemic. Um, just as much as DCH. I'm a last responder. I see what a child can bring back home to their parents and to their grandparents. Some things you can't get back, and that's life. I've seen a child come home, pass it to a parent, parent pass it to a grandparent. The parent and the grandparent are no longer here. That leaves a child with no grand parent or grandparent. Just a few things to think about because you all have a lot to think about going into school or not going in. Initially, I thought it was we we're going to wait nine weeks, see what other districts have done, take that, and then decide if we think it's best to go back into school. We can look right up the street to Tulsa County School System and look at the numbers that they have from going back into school. That should let us know right there. It's not the best time to go. We're going back into flu season. That's going to add to it. But if you decide to go back into school, just a few things to consider. We had a panel up here a few weeks ago that gave you all some ideas. One was, tell the kids don't use water fountains. Wonderful. So is the Tulsa City School System able to provide bottled water for each child that comes to school every day? And if so, how many bottles of water will you get the child? Will they get one or two every day? Will they get four or five? That's a cost. Are you gonna put plexiglass up in each classroom to divide the kids? That's a cost. Does each school have to have a nurse on staff? If the answer is yes, what about substitute nurses? Will it be more than one nurse? If a child comes to school, feels ill, sees a nurse, nurse sends that child home, child tests positive, now, there's a nurse that has to sit out and be quarantined for 14 days. I'm guessing. I may be wrong. But if that nurse has to sit out, who's going to place that nurse for 14 days? Just a few things to think about. Um, I had a lot of stuff written down. I may go over it. I may not. Oh, cleaning up the school. This is something that's more along the lines of professional cleaning. Uh, job, not a janitor that can just come in, sweep up. I worked at UPS for about three years. I was a supervisor. However, before being a supervisor, I was on preload and I was a hazmat person. If we had a spill, no one could touch it but the hazmat person. It could have been a bottle of water. But as a hazmat person, I had to respond to it. So if you have a child come to school, if you have a teacher come to school, they're positive. How do you determine what part of the school do you clean? And do you just clean that classroom? If you go by the contact, well, the teacher could have been on this side of the classroom, came in contact with a couple other students or teachers, they end up on the other side of the classroom or the other side of the school. Are you going to clean the whole school? How long does it take to clean a school? What are you going to do? Well, about the air system, the filters and the air condition. All these are dollars and cents. I'm not sure what your budget is, but if you want to go along those lines, provide water, provide masks for all the students, set up the air conditioning system where it needs to be set up, provide the dividers for the kids and for the teachers, have better, I feel more comfortable at that point. But each and every day, it's not slowing down, regardless of what you may hear. I'm telling you now, it is not slowing down. If I get to the point where I see, well, these cases are slowing down, and the people that I'm seeing and the loved ones that I'm seeing are not coming in and dying because of COVID-19, I'll be the first one to tell you, well, yeah, I know the numbers say they may be high, but it's slowing down. It's not. Thank you, Mr. Rollins. 
Thank you, Mr. Smith. Okay, item, no item number five, introductions of motions, resolutions for first reading, of which there is one. 5A is received, discuss first reading of the 2021 Tuscaloosa City School budget. Mr. Duke, good evening, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Vice Chairman, Board Members. It's an honor and privilege tonight to bring you the fiscal year 2021 budget. My first budget here, Tuscaloosa City Schools. And before I begin, I would like to read the preface uh, as prepared by the State Department of Education for our budgetary process. This document is presented to aid in the communication of financial information to the general public and to solicit input into the budgeting process for public education in the Tuscaloosa City School System. The attached proposed annual budget is developed for a fiscal year beginning October 1st and ending September 30th. Of course, in this case, it'll be October 1st, 2020 to September 30th, 2021. It includes funds received and generated from state, federal, local, other, and other financing sources. All budget reports are prepared in accordance with generally accepted accounting principles and comply with reporting requirements outlined in the financial planning, budgeting, and reporting system for Alabama public schools. The budgeting process is designed to develop for the school system a tool in order to provide an overall plan for the use of financial resources that will best serve the needs of the current student body and to encourage the concept of site-based management. With the implementation of site-based management decisions for the use of financial resources are to be made by the system's personnel responsible for accomplishing the desired results. In addition to the financial plan presented in the proposed budget, the school system is required to submit to the State Department of Education nine other operational plans. These additional plans are as follows. <clears throat> capital projects, student transportation, professional development, technology, special education, at-risk students, career technical education, federal programs, and school safety. Before I go any further, I would like to draw your attention to the table to my right. If you know Liz House, Liz, if you'll raise your hand, please. Thank you. That table right there, there is a, uh, there are multiple forms called a response to review of proposed, of, of proposed annual budget. This is a Alabama State Department of Education form. I've got pens over there. And if you have any um, response or proposed annual budget uh, comments, there's a form over there and we ask you to fill that out, put your name, signature, address, and telephone number, and do that no later than 10 days from today. Mr. Duke. Just want to get a clarification. That's for us or the, or the audience, correct? Either or or both. Just want to make sure the audience is aware of it. That's right. That's Thank right. You. Good. Uh, that's for anybody, general public, uh, board member, or otherwise. Thank, Thank you, sir. I would like to now take you through a, a brief journey and, and, and start by uh, looking back a little bit about where we've been in the recent past. Uh, I have up on the, um, the screen there a, a, a copy of the uh, Integrated Facility Analysis Demographic Study back from 2014 at which about time a capital plan, a strategic plan was going on. And also at that time a realignment of the sales tax which moved some uh, sales tax from the capital fund over to the general operating fund. Uh, during that time, there was a buildup 
of the general fund fund balance because of a lot of those things I just named. Then there was a planned spend of the built up reserve. Over the course of about the next four years, there was a spend of that built up reserve. And during that time, some uh, unexpected budget overages were incurred. That has created, created a challenging environment for the current budget. Moving along to some of our state funds for teachers and student textbooks, student materials per the state funded teacher unit are $600 per teacher. Those teachers, we call that teacher allocation money. They get to use that on classroom instructional. It was 600 last year, 600 this year. Those amounts are determined each year, each year by the state legislature. You will also see technology, library enhancement, professional development. The numbers are there on the page. I won't read all those out. Those are uh, committee by school elections on how to spend that money, and that is spent at the school site as determined by the leadership and the teachers at each of those schools. At the very bottom is our textbook allocation, which is a system-wide number and you will see a slight increase in that number. Annual debt service payments and uh, board, just so you'll know that we locked this budget down on September 1st and on September the 2nd, the very next day, we went to the market as I have um, relayed to you by an email and refinanced so when we do our budget among, uh, amendment in the spring these numbers will look better they will go down as we have had some savings from refinancing debt I'll report more on that in October a brief glimpse now at revenue state and local you'll see there in blue the numbers from last year for state 60.2 million and that has gone down slightly local as well local last year was 57.1 million and we estimate this year to be 56.7 million so state and local revenues we project will go down Mr. Duke, what's the, <clears throat> what is the cause of the state revenue decreasing? We, uh, it's, it's a two-part answer. It, the foundation program allocation, and I'm sure y'all have all heard of that, it actually increased slightly. The decrease comes from the, what's called the Advancement in Technology Fund, and some of you are aware of that situation, and we are um, hearing that it's possible that that may come to fruition in the spring but as of right now we are not able to budget that number as we don't have an amount and we don't have assurance right now as we budget of that amount mr duke um talking about the advanced technology fund could you go into um discussion with us about how the advanced technology fund has affected our previous revenue and what it looks like at this point uh, along those lines with mr wilson it, it has positively uh, helped our revenue in the past. And uh, the thing about that, it's not necessarily uh, guaranteed for the next year. It's based on some prior year calculations. And so the legislature, I, I'm gonna say called a timeout on, on the full allocation this year, which has caused this reduction uh, in the amount. And again, it may come to fruition in the spring that the legislature comes back and reallocates that money. But as we budget for FY21, we have no assurance or no documentation to, to budget that revenue. And so the, go ahead. And since we're, we're online and many of the public uh, do, doesn't know the amount of money that the Advanced Technology Fund uh, was, could you give us what the amount has been that was factored into the and the um, 
projected amount that it will possibly be right now? Sure. At, uh, in 2018, we got uh, half a million dollars. In 2019, we got 2.7 million. In this current year, FY 2020, the year we are in, where we had initially been told and, and had in writing that we were getting 5 million, that amount was reduced to 2.4 million. So, and so going forward, we have no assurance uh, that we'll even get that at all. So just hypothetically speaking, if that money was put into our general fund or using it as a budgeted item within our general fund, uh, that basically means that to me, we basically use ghost money almost that we should have always kept separate uh, within the fund rather than adding it in the mix. Is that correct? I would agree with that, and, and to the definition of advancement in technology money, it's to advance and offer one-time uh, boost in technology. So we're going to uh, look at, at maybe changing that scenario in the future. And so then with that also being said, looking at the, the revenue, and I want to thank you for even taking me through uh, the, uh, the, the money and the funds that we have. So then that means... If we're, if we're not going to get that same amount, that means that there's going to have to be some major cuts in our system, correct? Correct. So that means that, you know, and, I, and I'm going to say this publicly, I have always been a proponent of that we have, that we are top heavy and that we need to begin to look at how we utilize our funds as relates to um, um, going forward. And, and I want to thank you for being so thorough uh, in what you give us week to week. And um, I'm going to use Mr. Hamner's words. If you haven't spent some time with this guy, I, I want you all to know you ought to spend some time with him. And I want to thank you for that. Thank you for those kind words, Reverend Wilson. And that's a perfect lead in to my next two slides. As a matter of fact, I'll move on to the next one. Um, The um, salaries and benefits as a percentage of all of our expenditures, salaries and benefits being the, the red bar. And you can see that we are, as you all well know, we are salary and benefits intensive. And this kind of breaks it down by our, our, the different areas that we generally track as I show you each month on the, um, the general fund breakdown, instructional services, instructional support services, operations and maintenance. Auxiliary services, which is our transportation, general and administrative, and then our other expenditures. You'll see there the red bar is salaries and benefits, and that uh, is intensive as far as our budget to the tune overall of about 82 to 84 percent is salaries and benefits. Wow. That to, then, go ahead. I just want to make sure the board members are, we, we are looking at our computer versus the screen. He right. flip flopped the colors. Our okay. bars are blue, and you're saying red, so our colors are flip-flop if you're looking at your computer. It's a different version. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The bar on the left would be salaries and benefits. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Lucas. <laughs> the next slide, and I won't call out colors because I worry that it's messed up. <laughs> But, uh, I just didn't want them to get confused yeah, when you were you. saying red bar, because right. our red bar was way down. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. And, and this one's labeled uh, probably a little better, but um, we spend 59, almost 60 percent just on teachers out of our general fund budgeted salaries. Um, you see principals and assistants there, 5 percent, counselors 3 percent, uh, so forth and so on. So, um, and this is probably pretty standard around the state. I mentioned earlier our capital plan, strategic plan, uh, realignment of the sales tax, where he, we had been. And um, I can't help but smile when I, I see this picture of the beautiful new Martin Luther King Jr. Elementary School that we were all out at. I believe it was in March when we had the ribbon cutting. I, I think that was right before the COVID kind of hit. And uh, what, what, a, what a beautiful school. And um, look forward to that opening up soon.
Here's a snapshot. It's got a lot of information on it. I'll just kind of hit the highlights about where we're going. We are a system that's funded 13% federal money, 45% state money, 38% county money, and 3% city money, and 1% other. I've got a uh, ADM is student count. That's a average daily membership. So just so when you see that ADM, I think all you know that's average daily membership. 3.8% uh, growth um, in ADM over the last four years. I, I had somebody tell me that number's not a big number. I, I'll leave this with you as far as that 3.8%. That's the equivalent of taking Hale County High School in Malville, Alabama and dropping it in our system. So 3.8% is, is a lot of growth, in my opinion. And uh, so we, we're a growing system, as you all know. Uh, I've got a few bullets there of what we're spending our, our money on more now, uh, now than ever. And, and I, and I want to read a few of these. Social workers, we had two in 2010. We have 11 currently. Nurses, we had seven in 2010. Now we have 27. And let me tell you, those nurses are, are working right now. We'll be here soon for sure when those students come back. International business at Central High School and the Magnet School. Uh, technology infusion Chromebook purchases in addition to what we've done recently with the, uh, the online. Reading before third grade initiative. TCTA transportation. What I mean by that, the midday routes to the, to the tech center. Increase in art, music at the elementary, arts at Taspa and Bryan High School. Summer learning, that was scaled down a little bit this year because of the COVID situation. But that's a robust program, state of the art, nationally recognized. Our teacher salaries are three and a half percent above the state matrix. We got the best teachers in the state. Safety and security increased. Certainly since COVID that has uh, went down some, but that's an increased focus as well. And now it'll be health, safety, and security that probably will, will replace regular security. Foreign languages at our high schools. At the very bottom of the page, I wanted to issue um, to you one of our, our probably our biggest challenges and biggest opportunities, the simplified seller's use tax. And I think you've probably gotten at least a few emails from me here recently and you'll probably get more. We are missing out. More sales tax has been, has been diverted away from city schools. Because of the SSUT law, city school systems are cut out of the mix. So now for every online sale that somebody makes as opposed to going to the store, I'm gonna call it brick and mortar as a lot of people do, if it's an online purchase, we don't get any of that sales tax. That's huge. We're missing out tens, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars a month. So, Mr. Duke. Yes, sir. So, if, let's say, for instance, 200, uh, what, let's say, for instance, 300 of the 10,370 students go to an online platform that will greatly affect us, wouldn't it? As far as funding? Yes, sir. No, they'll still be our students. Okay. For the count purposes. Okay. I've had that question several times. That's a good question. Okay. They'll, they'll still be our, our students for the count. Okay, okay, thank you. Mr. Duke. Yes. Is there a way to get some comparison as to what other city school systems derive uh, revenue from the actual city, is that 3% that we get from the city of Tuscaloosa, is that in line with other cities, municipalities, or is that, if you know? I have done a little analysis on that, and I will share that to the board here soon. Thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. The next page is a, um, I, I took just the general fund as I like to do on our monthly reports and, and put down the budget for this year as opposed to the original budget for 2020 and, and showing you the difference as well. 
So for your review, there's that information. And then on the following page will be the full budget as it was on September 1st that we will submit to the state of Alabama on September the 15th. That's called Exhibit B1A. That's what we call our budget form. That's the condensed version of all of our different um, funds. And with that, I will be glad to take any questions. And that concludes my presentation. I have a question. Hey, Jay, um, going back to the online sales tax, um, and I understand how it goes if you're purchasing something from uh, Amazon Prime, not to give them any recognition or anything like that. But uh, what if I purchase something from the local Walmart or Target? I want to go and buy my groceries online, um, go have them put it in my car or whatever. Do I get those sales tax from the local level, or does that go to their corporate pot? And it's possible that I don't see those that tax dollar again. That goes to the SSUT and and is dispersed to the city and the county. So every online purchase, mm -hmm. whether they're purchasing it from local um, or nationally, we don't get any of that. There there may be a provision there depending on if it asks for your zip code sometimes, but a lot of those don't. Jay, I want you to go back, to, if you will, to the, uh, you know, we get over, over time, we always get questions about textbooks and what we spend on textbooks and the allotted money. If you'll go back to that figure of uh, the 777000 even though it sounds like a large amount of money, it's still not, we still have a negative as far as having to purchase textbooks. Just for the record, if you could explain a little bit on that. Well, and that's a good point, Mr. Lucas, and, and that number would, to get it down to a per student count would need to be divided by the, the 10,000 or so students we, that we have. So that number sounds big in and of itself, right. but then when you get it down to a per student, uh, we do have to chip in local money for that, yes. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Any other questions? Any further questions for Mr. Duke? Member Board, this is a first reading. Second reading and approval will be on next week's 915 board meeting. Any further questions? Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay, item number six, receive, discuss, approve the return to campus opening plan. Dr. Daria. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Board members, I in your on your table there's a draft uh, set of dates uh, to consider as we look at uh, returning students to campus <clears throat> the board agenda item calls for this to discuss receive and approve um, for this evening I'm, I'm not asking approval I, I, I am handing this as a as a discussion in preparation for next week so that is on your on your table and it looks like this and I'll just talk through this a little bit and um, what we hope to, to get to gain from uh, providing it <clears throat> the current recommendation that you have has elementary and middle schools looking at a staggered model starting September 21 and going through October 9 um, October 9 is the end of the first grading period which is actually just over seven weeks it's not a full nine week period when we adjusted the opening of school to August 20 it ate into that uh, opening nine weeks um, the 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 draft that you have there calls for a, re a return of in-person on October 12. Um, this, this approach that you see here uh, was discussed with, with by our health panel of looking at a staggered return and following the CDC guidelines. They emphasized that several times in their conversation. So I'm going to talk a minute about the high schools. Um, our high schools are in a bit of a different situation. Um, they're, resol they're resolving scheduling issues. Um, in trying to minimize the amount of sections in their schedule where a teacher has to teach in-person students in the same section as virtual students. Um, be, we had schools that had different levels of students opt in for the year-long virtual, which caused them to have to look at scheduling differently. 
Um, we are trying to minimize the, the cases where a teacher has a, for example, first period with a number of in-person students and a number of virtual students. There will be cases where that is unavoidable and has to take place, um, but we're trying to minimize that uh, because that is, that's not the preferred method. Um, so schools, the principals of the high schools and their teams are working to make some schedule changes for the students during the second nine weeks so that the teachers will have dedicated courses sections to either virtual or in person. Um, after talking with our high school principals about their schedules and then also talking with some of you all, um, I don't intend to recommend these dates tonight for your approval, as I stated at the beginning. Um, I, but I do believe, and as we heard from our health experts, that a staggered start is important and necessary as we look at phasing students back onto campus. Um, and a staggered, import, a staggered return is important so we can do this well. Um, as it stands, we currently have all students returning, if you will, at the end of the up to nine week period that we, that we approved in July. Um, that was for up to nine weeks with the idea that um, we would then return students or that that period would go away. Um, and I think it's important that we look at the staggered model to, to slowly phase students back onto campus. Um, and, and the recommendation that you have in front of you will accomplish that. Um, one of the, the goals in the logic of starting virtually was to get the virtual program up and running. Um, our teachers have done a lot in a short period of time uh, to learn the, the platform, to build on the platform. Our students have learned a lot in a short period of time using the platform. It's not perfect, but they have done a really fantastic job getting that moving in the opening of this school year. Um, we are in week three of that, um, and the more time we're on it, the the greater we can rely on it as our educational continuity plan should we need to rely on it for students being quarantined or um, stu teachers having to, to self-isolate. So the students who are in the year-long virtual, um, the only impact they would have as we move to an in-person model is their schedule would change. Currently our schedules are that our students in families where we did not have enough machines, they're sharing computers. So when we move to staggered and then in-person, our virtual year-long students will follow their bell schedule in high school and middle school. So if they have first period English, they will, they will virtually have first period English. So that will change as we, as we make this shift. Um, but we need to consider looking at dates for returning our in-person students back to campus. And the dates that you have here are, are starting points for us to consider to at least put in the path so that we can do the staggered um, prior to bringing all students back on campus, all in-person students back on campus. Now, the rates for Tuscaloosa have worsened since a short period of time ago when we were talking about returning in a staggered model. Uh, there were points in the last short period of time where we were below the 5% the and the 10% threshold that, that, that was put out there. Um, and, and that's different today. So. Um, I did go back to Drs. Crawford and Dr. White. They were on our panel with us two weeks ago. And I asked them that question and, and asked them of, you know, hey, the, the rate is above today where we would want it to be. What does this mean for us as we consider a return to school? And, and the response is the staggered model and follow the CDC guidelines. That's what they told us several times that evening. Um, that said, we still need to look at the current health conditions in Tuscaloosa. Um, that is, it's not, it is a consideration that we've got to look at before we make that final decision. Um, certainly it's concerning to see the positivity rate increasing and not decreasing. Ideally, we are at a lower rate. Um, as we talked about, I think last week, we, we also have to consider the, the health care system to make sure um, that, that it is low and, and would not be negatively impacted. So we have to look at those as we approach at least a target date for returning students to campus, which is what you have in front of you. Um, my goal for you tonight is to receive this, um, talk with others on it, uh, process it, and, and let's put at least a tentative plan in place next week for a, for a board action. Um, and again, it is subject it is subject to change because we have to look at where we are with local conditions and, and not one of us wants to ignore that or will ignore that. 
Um, but we've got to look at it in the total picture of making the termination on returning students to campus. Um, it, it does matter, though, that, that the computers that we needed to, to operate virtual for an extended period of time are not with us. Um, and it wasn't a, a long time ago that the, the conditions were better in Tuscaloosa. So the dates that are in front of you, board members, are um, kind of a jumping off point to consider, to put on our map, to look at a plan to get students back on campus. I think the most important thing that we've heard and discussed is the need to stagger for a period of time. Uh, this, this, the dates you see here, I think, looks at a stagger model for close to three weeks so that we can follow the policies and practices that are necessary to um, stay in school once we get into school. Um, so not, not on the board for an approval or for um, a recommendation to you this evening, um, but would like to bring back these dates with the, the revisions for high school um, added to this next Tuesday in our board meeting. And board members, I certainly would entertain at, at, at any point um, after the se this evening and after of any questions that you may have or information you need prior to making an informed decision. Um, if we need to have um, Dr. White or uh, Dr. Crawford come back to talk about the, the community transmission rate and the impact of schools returning, staggered or full-time in person, um, then we would certainly try to arrange that. We want you to make an informed decision, but I do think it's important that we at least identify a path as we um, we're approaching the mid first uh, grading, first grading period midpoint, and we need to look at a, a path forward for returning students to campus. Okay, thank you, uh, thank you Dr. Derry. Dr. Derry, just um, before I ask the board if they have any um, basic questions tonight, just so we're clear, next Tuesday the 15th, um, these dates will be before the board for approval or non-approval, is that correct? That is what I would ask you all to consider for next week. And I would say if it, if it goes beyond, um, so the, the September 21st is a date that is, is there. There's a point where it does take time for schools to make the adjustment to go to staggered, and we want to make sure parents have notice uh, uh, so that they can plan for the staggered model as well. So if, if we get to a point where we, don't give, we can't give enough notice to, to make that change, then that becomes troublesome. So. To answer your question again, yes, the idea would be next Tuesday to put these dates forward with the addition of dates for high school uh, staggered as well. That is not on this current draft because we will have final direction from our high school principals uh, this Friday. They will have resolution to their scheduling um, changes that they're making. All right. Thank you, Dr. Derry. Um, I would encourage each and every board member to uh, reach out to Dr. Daria this week with their questions. Is there any burning question that a board member has this evening on this um, draft uh, that we'll vote on next Tuesday? Mr. Chair. Dr. May. Dr. Daria, um, so if I understand correctly, the what was approved prior to the nine weeks starting was we would go up to nine weeks virtual, correct? If your recommendation next week is not approved. Once the nine weeks is over, is there any requirement for a recommendation or do we just start back full time face to face? My, my answer to that would be, it, it would be this follow the school calendar, which tr would be a traditional face to face. Without staggering. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair. Um, I chose to write mine down. Tonight, I chose to continue a discourse that I have said previously. Like every administrator, I would like Dr. Daria for all kids, all teachers, all administrators to be in an environment that is conducive for the learning process to go forward. I've listened to parents, physicians on a panel discussions, here as a board member, as well as talk to my own physician, Dr. Keisha Lothar, as well as Dr. Chris McGee, one who is an African-American female, another one who's a Caucasian male. And from, their, from the discussions that I've spoken with them, I gather that the numbers are up and down, hospitalizations are decreasing, CDC is constantly making revisions to the toolkit, and I must say population 
uh, numbers are going up and down. However, my c concern is have we really taken in consideration the subpopulations of population, such as our elementary school, middle school, high schoolers, those who uh, lack sufficient medical care. However, what concerns me as, is are we truly listening to what's going on around us? Or have we developed particular surveys that only provide means to solutions that are wanted by particulars? Return to school survey, for example, stating, and this is for an example, February 17th through March, thir uh, March 13th, which is three weeks virtual, March 16th through March 27th, which is two weeks staggered, then begin uh, on March 31st, a full-time virtual, I'm uh, full-time face-to-face. As I critically thought through this, I asked myself, were those who were given the survey able to fully give their true thoughts and feelings toward the return to school? As I pondered over this, as I looked at results provided to the board, I wondered were those who, I wondered were those who filled out the survey were they given more than two questions, or was the narrative controlled by those who created it, therefore alleviating the opportunity to give their true feelings and thoughts concerning return to school? My feelings are that this happened. Let me say this. I respect the science, but if science could, could, could make this pandemic go away, it surely would go away. Currently in our nation, we have forest fires, in one area, we have uh, uh, other fires with rallies in other areas. And here it is, we have storms. I'm concerned. How can I, in a good conscience, support a narrative that steers me in one direction when there are multiple ways to get into the anticipated and expected goal? I must say, I agree with Mr. Will, when he said concerning the, the platform, I've spoken that same issue concerning the platform of Schoology and the need of going back to what our kids were doing beforehand. I will agree with that. However, I must say I do want people to return to school, but if we do not listen to those who are employed by our system, I'm afraid that we will lose viable and credible instructors, support personnel, and team members of Tuscaloosa City School System. Furthermore, in, my, in many of our elementary classrooms, you've informed the board that our classroom space is limited, and even with a staggered schedule, there's still and will not be adequate distance for spacing out students. So therefore, I brought with me tonight a yardstick. Let's say, for instance, this yardstick is three feet. And walking in the classroom, here it is right here. That means that me and Mrs. Williams are not adequately distanced apart, which means that it's not safe for even our elementary school students to go back to school. I took the time, because I have the time, to go and walk in an elementary school classroom and saw that um, if I have four babies, four tables, six seats per table in a classroom, using this yardstick, three feet apart is, is impossible. And let me add, just because half of the students and teachers are virtual does not mean it affects teacher-student ratio. Then on last week, the board was informed that there are still many families who do not have more than one device, which puts CNI at a deficit. And many kids, for such reasons, are not getting the quality instruction they so desperately need, as well as teachers who want to teach, who don't and may not have the opportunity to instruct our babies at the level that they really want to. Sidebar, our teachers in this virtual assembly have rocked. They are making whatever we give them work to the best of their ability. 
However, I am concerned about their health and their well-being also. Many of them may have parents they are caring for with pre-existing conditions, children with pre-existing conditions, and or themselves with pre-existing conditions who were not even given the opportunity to have accommodations because of one reason or the other. I understand many of those conditions are sugar diabetes, high blood pressure, heart disease, and other such factors that put them at risk. I read an article in the Tuscaloosa News about racial conciliation from my good friend, Dr. Clinton Hubbard. His words echoed to me not only on racial reconciliation, but to this board concerning restart of school. He quoted, someone said to him, I am here for you, whatever you need, what I can offer you more than anything is I'm a good listener. As Dr. Hubbard believes the key to racial harmony is listening, I truly believe the key to reopening the buildings of all of our schools, not just elementary and middle, is wrapped up in listening. And listening is not always having someone to agree with what you say, but respectfully understanding what is being said. I quote again Dr. Hubbard, people who need to listen fail to hear the voices of those crying out. People in our communities are crying out both for and against. And, and many people in our system who work want and need their jobs. Some people will not come forth right and just speak because they are afraid, as it has been mentioned. They are afraid that their voices will not be heard. I quote again, President Barack Obama said in Selma, Alabama at the Jubilee when he was there, I went, I got the opportunity to see him. He said, we must be the voice for the voiceless. I'm hearing people all over this town, all over in this system, who are afraid to speak their true feelings for fear of being blackballed, as Mr. Will said, reprimanded, and even distanced. As a system, we are leaders from various areas chosen to speak in one voice for the system. Sometimes that may mean going against what a certain group wants, but what it is best for our children. Therefore, I'm asking the following questions to be answered to the best of your ability. Number one, what is the total amount of number of teachers that have had to be quarantined since coming back since August 12th? Number two, and since I typed this up, I will send it to you, Liz. <laughs> yes, ma'am. How many teachers, uh, how many custodians have had to be quarantined that are expected to clean the building? Who will fill the, their positions in case there's a recurrence? What is the plan for sanitizing rooms between students' classes? What's the plan when students return all day? Also, if CDC, CDC guidelines in regard to students being six feet apart in classrooms will still, be the, will still be followed once staggered happens, and especially when full-time face-to-face returns, how can we ensure this? How many students can fit in that normal-sized classroom and accommodate social distancing? I did some research. How many medical fragile students and students with underlying health conditions are face-to-face -face across our district. Have any other plans been presented to ensure the safety of students while bringing them on our campus? Currently, how many subs are available and currently in place at schools in the event that a quarantine has to take place? Will any teachers have to teach both, and, and Dr. Daria, you, you alluded to it, uh, teach, have, will any teachers have to teach both face-to-face and virtual simultaneously with current hybrid or full-time schedule, which you alluded to that you don't want that to happen. And I appreciate that. How are we going to enforce the wearing of a mask properly with our students? How many chances will a student have if he or she refuses to wear that mask properly before we send them home? If we have to quarantine students due to exposure by a school employee, do we have any partnerships in place with a health care provider so that our, our people won't have to incur medical costs if the exposure is a, is a result of a board employee. 
because many of our kids may or may not have the insurance and may not have and be able to pay co-pays. That's a sad day, isn't it? But it's a reality. If we have to quarantine teachers due to exposure by a student while performing their job responsibilities, like on the job injury, do we have partner, any partnerships in place with a health care provider so they won't have to incur medical costs if the exposure is a result of a board employee? I believe our employees shouldn't have to incur medical costs or copay due to exposure while on the job because we have put them in that position. If the percentage for positive rate in the county goes up while students are in school, will the students be put back on virtual until the rates slow down? I would, and I want to thank Dr. Cameron for, for beginning to give us numbers of, of the classifications of whether it was a teacher, CMP staff, and our secretaries in different areas. But I would like for the board to have that. What is the plan when a principal who does not have an assistant principal is if, if that assistant, if that principal is quarantined? What is the plan for that school? What number will every classroom be capped at for elementary, middle, and high? Does capping numbers impact participation in the TCTA classes? And how does the virtual option impact IB? AP and fine arts teachers, how would these teachers receive support and what does their schedule looks like? I wrote all those questions down because, and I'm, I'm taking some time because I recognize I have, I have people who go to both schools in my district. Some go to north of the river, the majority go to western cluster schools and I understand that. I believe that kids Having the opportunity to learn is first and foremost the best thing. I'm asking Dr. Daria, wouldn't it, listening to again Mr. Will who said Schoology is not working, I asked you Dr. Daria, why couldn't we use, continue to use what we've already been using since our students did a good job on it in the spring, in March? So I'm asking you again. That's not in these questions. Why don't we go back and allow our teachers to use the platforms that they and the students were used to so that we can accommodate the education if we, if, and seeing that the numbers are continuously going up. I believe kids can go to school and not be faced with COVID, Mr. Chair. But I do believe when they go home, a lot of kids in my district live in multi-generational families. They live with their grandmother. They live with their auntie. And many of those people are older because for, for some reason their parents are not there. God forbid, here it is, that student is asymptomatic and takes this COVID home. Mr. Rollins did not say that he was a funeral director, but he's a funeral director. My cousin is an embalmer. And listening to my cousin who's an embalmer, there are many cases of persons who have died from COVID that have not even been called COVID. But when the funeral home gets them, it is, it is designated COVID. I must say, I want our kids in school just like everybody else. But I am concerned about the health and wellness of everyone. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And Ms. Liz, I'm sending that to you right now. Thank you, Reverend Wilson. Anybody else? All right, we will stand adjourned until next Tuesday. Thank you, everyone.